everybody, and welcome back to the Taoist Arts Organization International Podcast. Uh, today's episode is part of our new Dowie Roundtable series. Uh, we have with us today, returning to the podcast, Shifu Neil Ripsky of Red Jade Martial Arts, currently of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Um, if you want to find out more about Neil and his history and his training and his school, you can check out episode 13 of the Dowie Talks uh, Expert Series. And also returning today for his second appearance is Shifu Dan Schultz of Red, hey, Red Jade McHenry, Illinois. Um, and you can find out more about Dan and his arts at school on episode 19 of the Dowie Podcast. So the, the subject that we're going to talk about today is Dantian and Dantian cultivation. And, you know, this is obviously a huge subject, but before we get started, um, I want to kind of remember that a lot of the people that might be watching this or listening to this may not know what Dantian is, or they may think they know what Dantian is and not necessarily uh, have the correct information, because as we know, this word Dantian uh, comes to us from Nadan, from eternal alchemy, but it's also used in Qigong and in martial arts, and it's not necessarily the same thing in those various contexts. So from a martial arts context, um, Neil, let's start with you. How would you define Dantian? Okay, so from a purely martial arts point of view, uh, I like to look at it first as a physical part of the body. So the whole, <clears throat> the whole of the kind of torso from the rib cage down all the way through your hips and ankle crease and your claw, all of that muscularity is sort of where Dantian resides. If you look in the Qigong world, they'll say it's behind the navel, right? About this distance in, it's so yeah. big. But at first, from a martial arts point of view, it's sort of your hips. And there's a differentiation between your hips and your waist yeah. that kind of was what creates Dantian. And that differentiation is just whether or not your hips are moving or your waist is actually engaged. If your waist is turning back and forth and there's an engagement in your muscularity and your hips are doing the same thing, you're probably moving your dantian. And when we're doing martial arts first, the, the hardest thing to get over is the mimicry of the very obvious part of things. So you throw a hand out or you throw a leg out. And then when somebody tells you this crazy idea about this ball inside your body, what they're trying to get you to do is get you to integrate your torso into the movement until it starts to be the origin of the movement. So that's how I would kind of start for anybody who's just kind of starting the martial arts side of this, this kind of discussion, because it is different from a Qigong point of view or a, a medical point of view. It is. It's Even though it's the same words, we all define them differently. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, you know, for people like me uh, that, you know, started back in the 80s, if you even had a teacher that knew the word Dantian or mentioned the word Dantian, all that you had to go off of was maybe some books or things like that. And it was so confusing because, you know, you're usually reading something that had something to do with internal alchemy or Qigong and, and not martial arts. And it was just a very frustrating dead end. Um, yeah. Dan, do you have anything to add to what Neil just said as far as like the definition or conception of Dantian and martial arts? Sure. I'm gonna, I've actually been thinking about this a lot because I've been trying to always simplify things for my students to uh, help them understand the best way possible. So I'm going to try and uh, define this in a way that will kind of tie everything together, both in a martial and non-martial context. Okay, great. So if we take, so we take the term Dantian, it's, it's often translated as elixir field. So the elixir, like we talk about nadon or Wydon, so Y is outside, Ne is inside. So an external elixir is something that you take from outside and put into your body. So like herbs or liniments, stuff that heals you from outside. Then nadon is inside an elixir, something from within that you cultivate to improve yourself, whether through health or to heal particular ailments and stuff like that. So it's some sort of elixir. Then the tin is field. And the uh, character is actually a box with a plus sign in it. And it's meant to rep represent a rice paddy field. So not like necessarily a field as in like a field of energy, but a field that you're cultivating something. So together, it means a field in which you're cultivating your elixir. So the context of elixir then is dependent on what you're practicing. So elixir in like external or external internal alchemy might be different than the cultivation that you're trying in martial arts in particular. So it just depends on what you're cultivating. So I like to translate it in the most simplest terms as a place of cultivation, a place where you put your mind to cultivate a certain aspect. So in the internal martial arts, we talk about Dantian 
in the lower abdomen, particularly talking about that qua area and the muscularity around it. But then there's also the other two dantians that are always talked about in the heart and in the mind. The heart is the next, next easier one. The mind is a little bit harder, but the muscularity around the torso and around the back and around the shoulders, that would be where the middle dantian in the terms of martial arts, the muscularity you're trying to cultivate. And then for the mind, it's about that relationship between the brain and the nervous system, trying to get it to respond to stimuli. So we can train our nervous system in the same way that in push hands, we train our tingjin, our listening energy, to be able to respond to things. So if we take it as this place of cultivation, it can become less of a limited idea and more of a, what are you trying to cultivate? Because if there's three dantians that are primarily talked about, there could be other dantians that we want to talk about as well. With the, the pre-heaven power method that I've been shown by uh, Master Wei Cheng Lin, it's, the terminology wasn't called dantian, but it's essentially dantian as if the dantian was running underneath the feet. So if the dantian of the lower body activates in the lower abdomen and the lower back, and the middle dantian works around the heart, the dantian below the feet essentially works the calves and the tendons around the feet. So you're trying to cultivate these different areas of the body. So really it could just be limited by nothing but what you're trying to cultivate in the moment. That's a great explanation. That's awesome. And that, that, that ties into what, you know, another confusing, um, uh, phrase, I guess, that some uh, older martial arts masters use about like bringing power from the ground. You know, that's another mystifying thing. When you first start out training and somebody talks about how your internal power comes from the ground, it's like, well, where is it? What are we talking about? But yeah, that's a great explanation. So I guess that would lead me to my next question. Um, and this is for both of you. Do you, is this something that you address early on in the training of beginning students? Or is this uh, something that like comes up naturally in the course of training? How do you introduce these concepts to your students? Neil, you want to speak on that? Yeah, sure. Um, that's changed for me over the years a lot. Because uh, the way I was trained is it wasn't introduced right away. Right. And I was kind of stuck in that same position. You were pre-internet. You hear a crazy word. You read it in a book and it's a Qigong book. So it doesn't make any sense to you because you're a martial arts guy. That was totally my experience. Um, and I found that when I started to get good teachers, I started to understand what it meant that myself... I got a lot better. So now I don't teach the way I was taught. I teach Dantian like the first day if I can. Because you can do something like that through a really simple exercise of just turning your body back and forth and swinging your arms and get people's mind to not be in their hands anymore where it generally sits. And rather, it's focused on, hey, my, my waist and torso are turning. And that is something you can teach in the first day. And then and slowly cultivate any movement off the top of that. So you always have this foundation underneath. Totally not the way I taught even 10 years ago. I would have taught shapes first before I taught the, the thing that was going on inside it. But I'm finding that um, the further I cut to it, the faster I cut to it, the more time, like Dan pointed out, it's, it's cultivating something in a field. Like you got to plant early if you want to reap a harvest. So why wait? you know, five years before you hear the words that you should have heard three years ago. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. What about you? My... Is, Dan, mm -hmm. is that, is that your, uh, what, what, what's your philosophy on teaching this sort of thing to students? Is that something you start early on like Neil does, or is it something that um, you do later on? Very early on, usually within the first five classes, depending on the student. If they've had like previous experience before, usually I'll talk about it the first day just give them something to immediately work on and start cultivating that they can not only use in my practice, but in their own practice. And then for uh, students who are coming to me for the first time with no previous experience, usually I use the first one or two days to just kind of observe, like I teach them some movements and I observe where their, uh, where their experience is and where they are at level wise to see what I need to address the quickest so if somebody has knees and improper alignment, usually I prioritize knees because knees are a big problem for a lot of people when they start to grow older. But uh, usually within the first five days, I start to address Dantian, like Neil said, to get the 
plant the seeds early. That makes sense to me. So for both of you, um, was there a moment in your own martial arts training where you sort of had like a light bulb come on or an epiphany where you realized that you're actually using this area of your body in an efficient manner? I want to hear Dan answer that one first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't really say there's one epiphany, but more like continuous epiphanies, especially within the past three years or so. Like, it's just been kind of ramping up the the longer I go, the the faster it ramps up where I just am starting to understand the concept of Dantian a lot more where before it was just like, okay, it's just a place in my body. I just got to train that place in my body. But as I started to expand my mind about the limitations and non-limitations of Dantian, then it really started to ramp up. Now I can, because I focused on these areas of my body, I can feel those areas of my body, whereas before I couldn't really feel it, much like when you are training something physically and you're using muscles that you don't use a lot and then you feel sore there. It's like, oh, I never felt sore there before, right? But now not only can I feel those areas engage, but I can feel the, uh, the micro tissues starting to move even slightly. So the more that I can become sensitive into my own body, I can feel the changes in motion that I can start to micro correct as I go on. So I guess less of a uh, epiphany, but more of a continuous understanding and realization. Neil, what about you? I can play the other side of that coin. I very vividly have a memory of uh, my very first, my very first teacher, my Jingwu teacher. He never even used the words Dantian with me. Okay. I was a kid started with him right but uh when i was getting towards my kind of black belt he gave me uh this homework assignment and it was to go through the form that i had to be tested on and, and demonstrate and i should kind of write down all of the different ways you could apply it so you might see that there's less obvious movements inside the movements okay that's that's what the homework assignment was i still do that all the time now thanks to him but I, I took it at first and I found all of these like punches and blocks and kicks. And then I started looking at different throws and it started to make more and more sense. And eventually I noticed that every single movement, my arms flipped over. One hand would go down, one hand would go up. Every single move in that form. And I was like, what? Wait a second. That means there's only one movement in here. And then I remember him always talking about, you got to move your hips with your elbows. And then that light bulb moment kind of happened for me where it was like, wait a second, this is all he was trying to show me the whole time was just this one thing. And I remember being really excited and talking to him about it. And he was like, that's like, that's the first connection sort of a thing. And if to this day, like that's, that's a vivid memory of mine, that moment where it felt like there was a huge number of like complex techniques and I was getting a black belt, right? You know? Uh, and they all sort of crumbled under their own weight and turned into one thing. And it was kind of like that was the core of it. If I can just turn my hips and my torso the right ways, I can make all of these things way stronger. And suddenly I'm getting my black belt and all that other kind of stuff, right? Because the very first realization started. But that was, at the time, I thought it was something special. Yeah. Now I realize it was, the, it was the very beginning of the seed breaking on. Yeah. Like now you can actually grow that's kind of what, what I think really happens. And then it's like what Dan was saying, that growing, if it's cultivated well, it doesn't stop, right? And the stuff Danny's working on is not even stuff that I've taught him maybe, right? I just think I got to help him with the, the cultivation of maybe the way to think about things. But now he's starting to get skills with his Dantian. I don't have because I don't train those ones. It's totally cool, but it's a, it's all cultivated on a, on a, a solid foundation of like, here is your body, here is your mind. Put these two things together first. And then the, all the techniques and stuff start to gain force and all of that stuff, because power generation is a big deal in martial arts. Right. But And that's what Dantian really starts out as for us as martial artists. Right. Not everybody has the epiphany moment the same way though, but I think everybody has that moment of they feel like it's gonna collapse into just a few things. Yeah, which is, ultimately the sign that you're on the right path. I think when all this stuff starts to, to blend together, 
But, you know, that that leads me to my next question. So, you know, the whole, I guess the usage of the term Dantian uh, first got adopted into martial arts by uh, Jijika, uh, you know, and Shinyi Luha. So mm -hmm. speaking about power generation in these different arts, is was there anything about your Shinyi Luha training that um, helped your understanding of Dantian? Did it further it in any way that was specific to that art apart from other yeah. things? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yes, that quick. Yes, it did. However, it took a long time. So Dantian in the center of the body where everybody thinks about it in your lower abdomen, if you think about it like it's a baseball or something, and your abdomen grabs it and twists and it makes everything move. What happens is that all of the power ripples out through this through the body from the center to the extremities. This is how like Tai Chi works, right? Tai Chi guy will move his waist and then it'll ripple down through his legs and out through his arms. That's what it looks like on the outside. A Shingy Lyoko person specializes in taking that idea and then moving it in different spots. So instead of putting it right dead center where like Tai Chi trains it, it'll put it like in your left hip. So instead it thinks of it almost like from my left, left foot, if you will, my left heel up through my left hip, through my left shoulder is like a rod. And that's going to be the moment and the, the spot where all the origin of my twist comes from. So what ends up happening is you spin about three quarters of your body around a little piece of your body rather than move your whole body in a ripple outwards. So you end up throwing a little bit more weight is what it does, is what it feels like it does. Because Shingi Lyoto has tremendous force. Yeah. And it's really effortless, but it's based on this idea of you're actually swinging your whole root and dantian, if you will, to one side and ripping the rest of your body around it. I don't know if that makes any sense to verbally talking about it. It, it does. And I mean, it, to me, that kind of sounds like what you were talking about, Dan, with like, you know, how a, a dantian can be like anything. It's almost like you're, you're shifting your center to a new center. You're creating a new center. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I like the way that uh, Neil first put it to me when when we were describing the Shin Lilha. It's kind of like cheating at internal martial arts. You get <laughs> the internal skills really fast because it's just power, just swinging from your whole body. Just it's essentially like you're just swinging your the side of your body at them and learning how to relax and let the whole heaviness flow through. Uh, most people talk about how in the Taiji they learned how to relax and to get that internal power. But for me, Shini Lilha helped me <laughs> more than Taiji to get that. And then I kind of used that to influence my Taiji to get the softness back again. But yeah, it, the way Lyoka it's essentially... Kind of... No, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just going to say Lyoka is kind of an unrefined art in comparison to Taiji, right? It kind of cares yeah. less about what's up and just more about the force in the end. Yeah, it's it's essentially like you're constantly swinging wrecking balls while with a tiger mindset of hunting down your opponent. And mm -hmm. that Dantian is chasing them, just locks onto theirs and just eats them alive. Nice. So maybe not exactly the flip side of the coin, but something uh, along a similar question line that I wanted to talk about is, you know, you, both of you guys are known for, you know, your drunken styles and um, uh can you talk a little bit about the use of Dantian and that type of movements? Because I know you have these sort of like much larger, uh, more like uh, obvious type movements, like the, the barrel washing and things of that nature. Could you talk maybe a little bit about that? Like, um, is, is the use of Dantian and power generation and, and your drunken style uh, radically different than the other things that you practice? Radically different. Radically different is, I don't know. I mean, I bet you, I bet you Danny's going, yeah, I can hear his brain from here. He's like, it's totally different. So here's something weird about, weird about Drunken. When you learn Dantian stuff normally, like when I started this conversation, I said, Dantian is this place in your torso. So first we break that. So you put the barrel on your chest and Dantian's actually sort of not in your torso. The idea of the barrel here is that you hold the standing posture, like your arms are round. And if you were to sway back and forth and let your weight move, you'll feel your weight kind of move out in towards your feet, your, your, your toes towards your hand into space. You'll feel it kind of run across and you'll feel it come back into your body and get heavy. So it's, in drunkenness, this is the wine. And the wine 
kind of is the action of Dan Tian. So the idea is that we're trying to throw that same turn that a Tai Chi guy does, but we're actually trying to do it with a whole bunch of our body weight, more like a Shingy guy does. So what ends up happening is the terminology becomes Dan Tian is gets bigger than your body. So the same movements are still taking place. The torso twists, the feet push the ground, but you're willing to go right to the edge of where a movement can be in order to put as much of your body weight on someone else as you can, which is why it looks crazy. Every push is exaggerated. Every kick is way too high and way too far back. It's because you're training how to get as much of your body weight momentum there without falling over as you can. So when it comes to the cultivation of this central power place of Dantian, this elixir, this spot where we're creating something, the, the only really radical thing is that you think about it like, what if it was hovering in front of my body? If I'd still twisted and turned exactly the same way as the one in my body, my body would move almost the same, but not quite. Because what's cool about the whole internal Dantian martial arts thing is that every metaphor changes the way you think about the way your body moves. And as soon as that happens, your body does start to transform in some way, shape, or form. All these training methods are like just tried and true. Hey, try this thing. Feel like you're a cartwheel turning or feel like you're a bird flying down to eat a bug. All of the poetry is that. And if you can get the feeling, the, the Kung Fu starts to happen, right? It starts to be that there's actually power and speed and heaviness and whatever. So... Drunken Stantian is kind of being thrown around like a wrecking ball. If I can throw it, the wine out to my hands, my whole weight in my torso is moving towards you. So if I like just run into you with it, the wine hits you. And, it, and in Drunken, you're not really fighting. The whole idea is that you're just going to get the guy wet. Mm -hmm. So if I just throw my everything at you, you're going to get wet. It may not injure you. It may not win the fight. But I guarantee you it's going to be annoying. Yeah. And then you know, you're dealing with all of this heavy sloshing force over and over and over from this wild person who doesn't make any sense. That's kind of its tactical point of view, right? I kind of went off on a tangent there. But. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I was looking for. Dan, do you want to yeah. add to that? Sure. Since he already talked about the uh, Dantian in the in the barrel, I think I'll talk about the, uh, the three Dantians that everybody talks about, the lower, middle, and upper, and how it kind of interrelates in movement. So... If we take a, each Dantian, is like they're all connected, but they're all stacked on top of each other. So we've got three balls on top of each other. The way that it kind of gives this like wild movement where the body's not stacked up right is it's those three Dantians kind of doing this and moving around in this spherical space. So it's really kind of like three spheres inside of another sphere that's rotating. And you could say it's actually the same as other arts it's just exaggerated it's not just small but it's going to show you every bit of where those dantians are moving so when you get those big winding circular movements it's like perhaps if my hips are remaining still the rest of my body is swinging and then hitting you with that entire force of my body swinging around like wrecking ball so if you keep those constantly in motion you're throwing momentum from your hips. You're throwing it down from the top of your body. You're swinging it all around. Your body's moving out of the way to dodge punches, both upper and lower body. It's just constantly in the state of motion. That's the same as other arts, but exaggerated to the extreme so that we can train where the limits of those arts stand before the principles actually break. And then we lose power, if that makes sense. Yep, absolutely. So, um, you know, we, let, let me ask you this, Neil, um, you know, we've all had like an experience of like training with somebody or maybe having a student that's just like stiff in the extreme, like someone who has like very little like flexibility in their torso. Um, have you ever had a student like that? And if you, if you have, what have you done to try to get them to, uh, learn to connect with that part of their body that we're, we're referring to as Dantian? Uh, yeah, I've seen that. Generally, what I'll do, like if, say the, the person in my mind, it was an arthritis thing. So you couldn't even do a stretching, you know, activation. It wasn't going to work. So what I what I did was I just taught the stone tablet of Chen Taiji, where 
You just tell them that their hips and their shoulders are matched. So those two things have to stay over top of each other all of the time. And then every time you move, your hips are either turning to the left or the right. And that may, it means that they don't get uh, much more agile in here yet, but it starts to activate all of the abdomen so that it's, it's grabbing on to keep the spine straight, right? So that there isn't a delay. So that really worked. This is an older Tai Chi student. That really worked for her. And then we started doing different movements that were delay movements. So it's the same thing as you create the stone tablet and then you break it. So then it becomes a lot more like drunken, where you'll teach the bottom one, your bottom dantian, so your hips move, and your heart should move after it, but it should be in a delay. It should take a little bit of time because what's happening is that your tailbone is twisting and all of the vertebrae are twisting all the way up. So there has to actually be a delay there if we let that happen before the heart will actually be, be moved and twisted, right? Middle dantian. And what we instinctively do is hold those together. So you teach them to hold it together so they know they're holding it together because you can't ever let something go until you pick it up. So you give them something to pick up and then you say, okay, you know how you do that? Yeah, that's totally wrong. Don't do that. And then they can put it down. And then you start to work on this delay. And that, what that does is it starts to create the twisting dragon body part of martial arts, and which is of the, the Dantian cultivations, right? Then you're looking at that there's six directions. So you need to start moving your torso in all these six different ways to get all of the different muscles activated to build something that becomes greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah, that makes sense. I oftentimes find that people forget that they have a back side of their body. You know, it sounds kind of strange to say, but our eyes and our front of our head, and we're always think of, you know, our, our core, our Dantian is just being only this, but we have all of this back here that we also have to bring into play in the movement as well. That can be a challenge for some people. Dan, is there something that you uh, specifically use to um, uh, work with people that have this issue? Like it might be stiff or have a hard time connecting with that part of their body? It's actually interesting because one of my first students like uh, was looking to essentially loosen up his upper back and uh he wanted to learn baguajang for that because he saw my movements through video and that's how my back was kind of wavy and allowing freedom of movement so i started him with taiji and bagua stuff because he had already been a chen style guy before and he was still having some troubles and i was trying to teach it to him but then i had the idea well our snake system in the ma family is really, really good at loosening up the lower back and the, and the upper back. So I decided to teach him snake, one, because it'd be good for him, and two, because I like snake and I want to teach it. So I want an excuse. But, but uh, the, uh, the snake, I'd say, is kind of the limit of orthodox in this matter before we get to drunken and it's all toppled over and everything. But it's very much like uh, Neil was describing in the way that one Dantian will move and the other one Dantian will move in a delay. So snake is the exaggerated form of the orthodox in this matter, where you're literally like a snake. A snake d doesn't move its whole body stiffly. It will wave and turn and twist and coil and writhe. And, and the the whole body has to do this. The, the problem that most will get with snake kung fu is they have the snake arms, but their body is stiff as a board. So we teach from head to tail all the way through the arms as well is the entire snake, not just the arms, but all the way through the body. So that helped him immensely with that as well. So we've been working on that. That makes sense. So Neil, you know, we talked a little bit at the beginning about how, you know, uh, the Dantian is not necessarily the same thing in Qigong and, and Nadan and, and martial arts, but, uh, there are places where they intersect. Could you maybe talk about like a sort of like a intersectionality of the Dantian between Qigong and, and the martial arts? Okay. <clears throat> so to shift gears from the, the six sides of Dantian and the muscularity part of it, the way Dantian is described in Qigong, where it's a point inside your body kind of behind and down from your navel in your, in your torso, maybe the size of a fist or two, sort of a glowing ball of energy. Yeah. That kind of point of view, um, what it ends up doing is it builds kind of a gear system, in my opinion. I'm going to go like really martial arts in here and move towards Qigong. 
So if I'm thinking about my dantian being my whole torso and my, my torso turns and that powers my punching and my kicking, it's like a bicycle. If I put a set of gears on a bicycle, if I don't only have one gear, every gear I up, right, every time it gets closer and closer to the center, the more power starts to get created because more and more of your body is engaged, right? So at the very surface level of martial arts, even when you're starting dantian, you get external power, which is that the muscles, everything on the outside start to work. So if you start thinking about Dantian as this smaller place, this ball, this something that you can visualize and think about and have a story about, because if you visualize and think about it and have a story about it, it starts to get real in your head. You think about this thing and where it belongs in your body, you've been told where it goes, and it's from the ancients, so you can trust it, the whole story is there. Then you start being able to focus on a deeper part of your body. So must get more and more muscle gets engaged, sure, but it's more like the layers of things get engaged. So the fascia starts to get more engaged. And if your connective tissue is engaged, the whole system starts to work like a big machine. That's where fa jin comes from. Is you need to have the jin, you need to have the fascic connections between the muscles and the bones able to deliver that kind of rotation. So what I found happened when I was training with Moss, he trained me to do a meditation where I was looking at this, this qigong bone, right, in my belly, while I was standing in a horse stance and just telling me to turn left and right with it. But that it moves first. So my mind goes to it, I watch the ball turn, and it throws my body to the left or the right or whatever. And at first, it doesn't work. Like, it just feels crazy, you know? But if a little bit later on, you feel like your body engages on a deeper and deeper level until this, this really becomes the root of your movement. And what you're doing now is you're actually looking at your own mind to drive in your body. So things start to change because the more you integrate your mind in your body, the more powerful you become, the more healthy you become, all of that stuff. Because the way that we're sort of conditioned right now is that we sort of live a short distance from our bodies in the internet most of the time, right? So the closer we get to a part of our body, and it's a part of our body that is visceral, your, your sandwiches go there. You feel good there every single day. You can find there. It's not hard, right? If you think about it viscerally, then that connection can become mental. And that's when, I'll put it in Ma's terms, that the Dantian will eventually float free out of that spot. So it's like it's the very center of the gear system. Everything's rocking and rolling. you got a high gear. And then it's like, I, it, for me, it felt like something like broke. I thought I did something bad, actually. And then it was like, there was a delay between my mind telling Dantian to move and my body responding. But the delay became a big cascade of muscular contraction. And that's when I was able to start to do Fajin, truly, was that this weird, I had this moment where I felt I actually broke something in my abdomen. But it was this, this moment that Ma had described that um, the Dantian floated free finally. It wasn't really buried in the meat anymore. The meat was just responding to it. And then it became this, this cascade of movement, right? It changed everything for me. But that, that is kind of the intersection because when you're working with Dantian from a Qigong point of view, Dantian is self-generated. You get told an idea by somebody that you trust and you believe the story. Then you tell yourself the story to see if it's true. And you self-generate this place that everybody else self-generated for the reason of X, Y, and Z, master, could do magic powers or were enlightened or became immortal or whatever you like, right? And you have to you have to start with a foundational uh almost a leap of faith to get the bottom line started, right? That's why from a martial arts point of view, I try to do muscles and stuff like that, because that's where everybody sits most of the time. That's where your mind sits. But really, your mind is the thing driving everything. It just takes a little while before we can even observe the point itself. If you know what I'm trying to say, if that is clear enough, I don't know. I do. That's that's about the most brilliant answer I could have hoped for. I think I I had a very similar experience from what you were talking about doing the the brocades, the eight section brocades, and that that for me was sort of the link up between my martial arts and my qigong practice. And I I did the brocades, uh, you know, on on someone's uh, advice, and I it was a long time because I, I I didn't really want to do them that much, and I, I think about two years into it of just daily practice, I had a very similar experience to what you just described. So yeah, it was a great. The more people I talk to, 
who've been training a long time, like yourself, like Dan, the more I realize there are a lot of signposts that we actually all walk by. Yeah. Like I, I barely have ever told anybody that story because it's super weird, right? I saw like a big floating ball, like I'm a crazy person. Yeah. But I had a similar experience. That always seems to be the case because I think it's a signpost moment. I, I don't know what other what you may have saw when I, you know, when I did it, it might have looked different. But that feeling of like, whoa, something is real different today than it was yesterday. Yeah. And it's a visceral thing. And then there's this result because the, the seed is sprouted that you cannot deny, right? It's what kind of makes you drink the Kool-Aid, makes you a true believer. Because finally, if you've been training long enough, something has, you know, finally worked. Something actually worked. And those are all the signpost moments, I think. I think that's one of the reasons that people, um, you know, for instance, try to do Iron Palm. Yeah. Is they're actually seeking a signpost moment. I can break a brick. Right. If I can break a brick, I'm a better man, husband, warrior whatever you want to be right? right and that gives people the carrot to chase but yeah. it's supposed to be a you break the brick suddenly you should be able to like do all of your martial arts differently you f you should know a thing now you're not a brick breaking machine right yeah perfect answer dan do you want to add to that do you have an experience like that that you'd like to share well actually i was going to uh since we were talking about uh, qigong in that context, I had a experience when I was uh, researching, like uh, trying to put this into scientific terms. And I was looking up some articles and uh, it was really interesting because I found that in the, in the abdomen, there's layers where uh, normally you have like a layer of muscle and then a layer where it contains the fat. In the abdomen, we had a, a layer of muscle a layer containing fat, a layer of muscle, layer containing fat, it layers like so. So there's more tissue there that contains fat than other parts of your body, which I found is very interesting because we talk about Lord Dantian and the Qigong sense as an energy source. Yeah. And we talk about post heaven chi, the, the chi that we gain after we're born. We talk about drinking good water, eating good food, breathing good quality air. And then it all comes down to the lower Dantian and we gain energy, we feel good. So in the, I found it very interesting because again, we talk a lot about breathing through the lower Dantian area. So when we breathe from the lower Dantian area, we're ex exercising those muscles more and more, not only for like the purposes of like strengthening one's core, but also to break up those way to uh, find out about the things that I've been taught for so long in the scientific terms now, where all the energy that then breaks up the fat and then converts that fat into energy at the lower Dantian area. And then we feel good and we can exercise more, but all starting from just the simple act, act of changing how we breathe and changing how we think about our bodies and our lower Dantian area. So I thought that was a very interesting when I, when I found it for the first time. It is very interesting. And that, kind of leads me to my uh, next question. And this will probably be the last question, but you know, when we start looking at things like, you know, Neil mentioned fascia and things like that, there's a lot more uh, scientific uh, research being done into these areas now, you know, it's, it's not well understood. You know, we tend to think that, you know, Western medical science has all the answers, but you know, they're still finding out things every day too, obviously. Uh, both of you have had many years of experience in training cultivating the Dantian using these old methods, you know, methods that have been around for hundreds of years. Can you see a different, more efficient method of learning to use the Dantian or learning to use the body coming from science anytime soon? Do you see any developments lately that have piqued your interest, make you think that this, there might be a way to uh, learn this type of thing in a, in a faster manner? Or do you think the, the, the methods that we have now are about the best that we're going to get? I think I, I would say that if you look at where all this stuff comes from, the very words that are used to describe it talks about things being classical in the way that it's taught incrementally through time. You can't make a tree grow faster. I wish I could have made my dantian do something before that day. Because, like, it was embarrassing far into my training, let's just say, like, 
it wasn't three years in. We're like 10 years in yeah. before that happened. Um, I don't know if I could have grown it any faster, though, because it had to do with all of the things that I had been learning and practicing, the environment I was living in, who I was living with, everything had to do with what happened there, how I was practicing. So I think the, the best you can do is learn the best method possible, meaning something that other people have had success with, right? It doesn't have to be super famous, any of that sort of stuff. It just has to be there's a lineage of people being successful if they learn this thing. And then doing what it tells you to do, even though it seems crazy that some of those people are like, yeah, stand for an hour a day. Yeah, but you can't make a tree grow faster. So if, you, if you're only training an hour a day and not the other 23 hours, how much are you getting done? It's kind of the point of view from there, right? And you have to just cultivate it the way you need to. You have to water it, give it some sunshine, give it some rest, give it some oxygen, and, and that's it. I don't really think that there's going to be a scientific breakthrough that's going to say, oh, dude, all you got to do is put this weight on your big toe and all your fashion will change and your body will engage with your mind. I don't think we can force it to happen. Best thing... I've seen through my teaching career is just the more verbally uh, literate you become, the better that you can communicate what you're feeling in your body. Cause it's a weird thing. Martial arts, we communicate a subjective experience to other people and then say, just do the same thing I'm doing. Yeah. So you have to be a good communicator. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest breakthroughs that we're going to have is that the people that are starting to carry the lineages now are getting trained in science. And they're bio doctors and they're Chinese doctors. They're not just scrubs that used to fight at the bar like you would have seen 200 years ago, right? They're not just, there's not a bunch of bandits out there. So the way they're starting to describe things as they cross reference them might change. But I suspect nature's still going to have to take its course. That's, I mean, maybe I sound like a curmudgeon, but. No, I agree. Yeah. Dan, what do you say? I, I'm going to mirror that with my own words. I think there's two parts to consider. There's the intellectual understanding and then there's the embodiment of what we're trying to practice. So I, I talk with my students, I try to break things down as much as possible. Then I ask them afterwards, do you have any questions? Does that make sense? And they say, I can kind of wrap my head around the idea intellectually. Now I just need to <laughs> embody the principle. I don't quite have it in my body yet. So we can plant the seed intellectually in them and then it's up to them to practice and practice is different for everybody. Everybody learns at different paces, but we can't really, we can't really force them to have Dantians. We can't really force them to have power. It needs to be cultivated over time. So I guess you could say we can plant the intellectual seed more hastily, but the actual physical results will still take their time to cultivate. That's what I think. I agree. Well, guys, thank you very much for talking to me today. This was super enlightening for me. Um, would you like to tell everybody where they can find you at? Uh, Neil, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell people where they can find you if they want to learn more about this sort of thing? Sure. Um, actually, I'm teaching online and privately and I'm doing online group classes now. And all you have to do is contact me at neilripsky at gmail.com. Awesome. I also have a YouTube channel. And it's called Red Jade Martial Arts with like a thousand videos on it probably by now i don't even know but if you want if you wanted to see how i teach and things like that they're definitely on the red shade martial arts youtube channel right and we'll put links to both of those in our description uh daniel uh there's my uh, website which is red jade daniel dash san dot webnode.com that's essentially my hub where you can kind of get to everything that i do i have my blog i have my online classes via patreon I have my local classes and everything for about finding me and contacting me is there. And then I'm also, uh, oh, sorry, I'm blanking, but uh, I have a YouTube channel that I'm starting to post to more regularly now. It's a uh, Red Jade Martial Arts of McHenry. So not too much different from <laughs> my teachers. So you don't have to memorize something completely different, but I'm starting to, uh, I'm releasing a video series on a Chinese martial arts poetry and their meaning. So the poetry behind martial arts and the technique names and, and what they have significant to the martial arts and the martial arts techniques themselves. So you can follow me on that as well. Yeah, and I highly recommend that series. It's very uh, enlightening and entertaining as well. 
So I got to say, I really actually dug that series too. I haven't talked to Dan on the phone in a bit, but I got to tell you, Danny, I've really enjoyed that too. And anybody who's been following either one of us, Danny's the guy in the United States. If you don't have a passport, you should be flying to see Danny. There you go. Well, Neil Ripsky, Daniel Schultz, thank you guys for talking with me today. Mm -hmm.